Hello and welcome to our weekly COVID update with Dr. Satyajit Rath. Thank you, Dr. Satyajit, for joining us today. And uh, to start our show, you want to uh, first look at, look at the situation in India, where we see that we're again seeing a surge in the number of cases. It's being called the second wave, or perhaps it's not really the second wave. We've had many waves now. So what do you think about this? What, what is the reason behind this? Why is, why is there a uh, spike in cases again? Um, the virus does not recognize political geography. Um, this should be self-evident, but uh, is quite frequently forgotten. So it's worth underlining. Um, as a result, what we are really looking at, when we speak of a national surge, is simply an increase in aggregate numbers. That's not necessarily saying that cases in every town or every state or every neighborhood are increasing all at the same time. It's essentially a convergence of a large number of small local outbreaks where transmission numbers are increasing. The pandemic is still going on. Every time national numbers decline, not simply in India, but across the world, communities and societies, and even more so governments who really should know better, begin to pretend that they have won a victory and that the virus is vanquished. None of this is true. The pandemic is still going on. There, the virus needs to be present in some infected people from whom transmission will happen efficiently in order for a local outbreak to, ha to occur. These local outbreaks at some level are statistically random uh, events. So they're helped by all sorts of things as we will come to in a minute. But Essentially, this is simply a convergence of many small outbreaks. So a reasonable question to ask is, are we seeing a lot of small outbreaks? And the answer to that is yes. We are seeing these small um, outbreaks and we will see that in metropolitan cities, such as Pune where I'm sitting, um, uh, case numbers are increasing. Once again, they are increasing in urban, hyper-crowded, working-class communities and neighborhoods, only this time in communities where case numbers were not that high six months ago, when we had our first national peak, as we insist on calling it. So it's really a matter of the virus beginning to pop up in communities where it hasn't so far been over the past year. Hmm. And as a result, beginning to spread. The second thing is that we are beginning to see cases happening in um, so not in so-called Jogi Jopri neighborhoods, but also in so-called apartment complex neighborhoods. In other words, shifting from hypercrowded working class neighborhoods into somewhat more um, lower middle to middle class neighborhoods. And because distances between people are inevitably a little bit more in middle class neighborhoods, the speed of transmission still remains relatively low, even when case numbers are increasing. So there is, there is a pattern under all the statistical uncertainty of the pandemic. What this search really does say is that the whole notion of a country achieving herd immunity and uh, with natural infection and thereby overcoming um, the epidemic and the or at least the epidemic nature of the disease is really a pipe dream. Of course, an important way to uh, uh, overcome from this uh, pandemic is through our vaccinations. But even there, we're seeing that in India, again, um, uh, healthcare workers, frontline workers are skeptical of getting vaccinated from our indigenously developed vaccine, Covaxin. So, and at the same time, uh, we have our health minister, Harshwardhan, promoting another cure, so-called cure, Patanjali's uh, coronal, which is again without any uh, 
evidence backing it. So, you know, what sort of message does this convey? And uh, also, what do you feel about this skepticism towards coaxin? Um, it's not entirely skepticism. So I think that we need to keep in mind three factors that have contributed to the massive shortfall of vaccination uptake amongst healthcare workers. Clearly, there has been a massive shortfall of vaccination uptake. But all the reasons are not necessarily connected to vaccine skepticism. So a major reason is that the um, way that vaccination has been structured for them, as I, for example, have been told in the city by um, friends, colleagues, and acquaintances, is that when your name comes up in the list for vaccination on a particular day, you get that information with very um, little time. Mm -hmm. So for, for many physicians, for many nurses, it has simply not been possible to turn up on that day at that time, especially given that you inevitably have to wait and so on and so forth. So um, clearly that has been one factor. A second factor has been the repeated uh, examples of the COVID app glitches, hmm. um, which again are not to do with uh, any vaccine skepticism but instead to do with the practicalities and logistics of the vaccination campaign. There is one component of vaccine skepticism that we have heard repeatedly articulated that says, I, I'm not going to take the vaccine right now. I'll wait. I'll wait for six months and let other people take vaccine. And you know, depending on how it all looks, I will decide six months later whether to take vaccine or not. And I find it very hard to think of a, uh, less community oriented viewpoint than this mm. a more let me be blunt a more capitalist viewpoint than this um, but there are two other issues that contribute to vaccine skepticism well three the first is of course that the upper classes metropolitan upper classes in india have imbibed uh, some of the anti-vaxxer, anti-science perspectives that, are, that have gained some traction in Europe and North America against vaccines as with, with, with vaccines as, as, as bad, vaccines as evil, vaccines as toxic, and so on and so forth. But apart from that, there are two components that have fed the narrative of vaccine skepticism or fed the idea of vaccine skepticism. One is, that all said and done, the ICMR Bharat Biotech uh, vaccine, I guess we have to call it, Covaxin, as, we, as you point out, has been given approval without even today, over a month and a half, I think, after approval has been given, any preliminary evidence of protective efficacy. Exactly. That has led to very many people saying, you know, whoa, all sorts of approvals are given without making the necessary nuanced distinction between the Oxford AstraZeneca Serum Institute vaccine, the Covishield vaccine, which has been given approval for emergency use without, uh, with, with these kinds of preliminary uh, data and numbers for protection and Covaxin, for which we were told a month and a half back that within a fortnight there would be data. Now we've been told yesterday that within a fortnight there would be data. So now again, I think that the data will show protective efficacy. And, and, and we've discussed on these, updates, uh, on these updates why I think so. But on the other hand, the way that the government of India, in its anxiety for its own version of vaccine national nationalism, has handled the approval process, has fed inadvertently into a narrative of vaccine skepticism. Added to this is another component that the government of India has inadvertently fed into. But this time, it is fed by this government's enormous love for slogans. 
And one of the slogans that has been promoted that has caused confusion is the government slogan, or more correctly, the prime ministerial slogan of Dawai Bhi, Kadai Bhi. And what is apparently meant by Dawai is vaccine. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's a perfectly praiseworthy idea to try to convey that you should take the vaccine, but you should still keep physical distancing. But for pity's sake, Dawai means medicine. And medicine is something you take when you're sick. Repeatedly, amongst healthcare workers, especially in the um, uh, supporting nursing assistant level and category of workers, I have heard anecdotal stories saying, oh, the prime minister has said, dawai leni hai, to jab bimar pad jayenge, to dawai le lenge na, vaccine le lenge. And this, really, attempting to create a slogan-based, publicity-based bragging point has again inadvertently contributed to vaccine skepticism. So these are the components, I think, of the present situation of vaccine skepticism. The um, other question you ask, which is related to the recent uh, presence and um, support from not one, but two union ministers, not simply the Minister for um, Health and Science and Technology, Dr. Harshwardhan, but also Mr. Nitin Kadkari, who, who was present and who was greatly supportive of this uh, um, medication called Coronil, which first came to light for six, six months odd ago, um, and then went through a very large number of contortions um, before acquiring uh, some sort of an approval, the basis of which is quite unclear, from the Ayush department of the regulatory authority. Again, to have approval given without evidence of efficacy damages both the integrity of the process as well as feeding both an anti-science narrative as well as feeding a science skepticism narrative in the vaccine context. So none of this is helping. And uh, moving on to the United States, which is another interesting example of all of these factors playing together, we see that well, on February 22nd, the country crossed 500,000 deaths. It still has the highest number of uh, cases by a large margin, I think 28 million cases, over 28 million cases, which is over a quarter of all infections. And India is, you know, the second uh, highest, which is far behind at 11 million cases. We see these extremely high numbers. And we also see that the US is also the country which has administered the highest number of vaccine doses. I think around 60, over 60 million doses or so. So how, what explains this sort of contradiction? Well, there isn't really a contradiction. He, he, we, should, we should all keep in mind that a vaccine is not a magic bullet. It doesn't instantly uh, cover you like one of these Avengers movies in uh, an impenetrable virus, impenetrable shield the moment the needle enters your arm. Mm. Um, it takes at least a fortnight for good, substantial, high quality antibodies to be generated in response to a vaccine. And um, uh, in fact, at least for some people, it takes the second dose, which is taken four months later, in order for those antibody levels to be generated. That's not true of everybody, but it is true of some fraction of the vaccinated population. And if you look at the, um, if, if on the Worldometer site, you look at today's graph of the daily case numbers for the United States, you will see that over the past fortnight or more, um, I think ever since the end of January or late January, case numbers in the United States have been steadily declining. Mm. So um, unlike for India, where over the past 10 days or so, 
on the same website, case numbers have begun to show a modest increase. Yeah. So uh, these are patterns that are driven where we identify cases, but the cause causation of the cases is back in time. So it's perfectly plausible for American authorities, um, health authorities, as indeed they have argued, to claim that vaccination to a certain extent is working because case numbers are declining. Now, is that necessarily the case? Again, as we have repeatedly pointed out on this program, we should be uh, we should learn a little bit of humility in the face of the sheer unpredictable nature of any pandemic. Something that sounds reasonable and rational and kind of sort of evidence-based for us to adopt. If we do that and case numbers decline, we shouldn't be in a hurry to say that that has necessarily worked. There are coincidences in these kinds of situations. So we will wait and see. But to all appearances, American case numbers are steadily declining. And uh, there are other places in the world where case numbers are increasing. The pandemic is still to run its course. Is vaccination going to bring speeds of transmission down, reduce the numbers of outbreaks? Absolutely. Is that going to happen even in a place like India, where the rate of vaccination and the uptake of uh, vaccination is much, leaves much to be desired? Yes, it will. But vaccination is not some sort of a magic bullet that's going to terminate the pandemic. So thank you, Dr. Satyajit, for joining us today in this discussion. Again, we'll come back to you next week to continue these uh, updates. Thank you for watching NewsClick.